there was something about us that really clicked and we really got each other. And there were many ways in which we just, we like to spend time the same way. We thought the same way about things, including about money. So we were just very, it felt very familiar. In my opinion, choosing the right spouse or life partner is arguably the most important financial decision that you're ever going to make in your life. There are all sorts of things that couples want to agree on when deciding to tie the knot, money being the biggest thing. And if you don't see eye to eye, it can quickly become a huge source of conflict. So I just said, you know, let's have a conversation about how we combine assets. And he basically said, I'm not comfortable with that. Like, I can't get there yet. But even worse, what do you do when it turns out the person you chose cheated on you? He gave me an STD and then lied about it for seven months while I went to different doctors to try and figure out what it was. I basically just wrote him a letter and said, I'm moving out, I'm filing for divorce. So for this episode of Money Wise, we're not going to share the name of the guest. And after you listen to the podcast, you're going to understand exactly why we did that. So let's call her Jennifer. Jennifer has built a thriving consulting business and it's worth around $10 million. She walks us through how she handled every stage of her divorce, both emotionally and financially. I took a settlement because it would be over. I've just decided to treat it as a bad investment, get my money back and walk away. And I got it in cash. I've had a ton of these money conversations on this podcast. And honestly, Jennifer is in the top 1% of people I've talked to. She's got a positive attitude despite all the crap that she's been through that I frankly find incredibly inspiring, and I think you will too. And as usual with Money Wise, we're going to get super specific about all of her numbers. So that means how she built her wealth and what her wealth was before and after her divorce. I'm Sam Parr, and this is Money Wise. You can scroll through Instagram for just 30 seconds, and you're going to see a ton of junk teaching you how to get rich, but none that really explain how to handle life after you've already made a little bit of money. I'm co-founder of a company called Hampton. We're a community of CEOs and business owners, and our members range anywhere from new startups with 10 employees all the way up to publicly traded companies with hundreds of millions in revenue. And so because of Hampton, I'm able to see all of these private money conversations. And frankly, I think some of them should be done in public, hence this podcast. In MoneyWise, we provide advice by speaking to people who have made a ton of money and they're radically transparent about all of their numbers, meaning their monthly expenses, their portfolios, their net worth, all of that type of stuff, but also, and more importantly, all the issues and problems that come with being successful and how they're solving them. And of course, if you're the CEO of a startup or owner of a small company, you're going to be part of a group of eight people who have similar sizes and types of businesses as you. They're also likely going to live near you and you're going to have access to thousands of other members as well as hundreds of in-person events throughout the year. So check it out, joinhampton.com. So as I mentioned, Jennifer has built a thriving consulting business. She had a passion for business early on, but before that, she was also interested in journalism. I couldn't decide which of the two to do. And I finally thought, well, I'm 21. I'm already broke. Might not be a writer at work at Starbucks now because I can always go into business. So I did about five years of journalism and made my way up through the trenches, interned, freelanced. Ultimately, journalism wasn't a passion. I was just a good writer and wanted to figure out where to plug in. So I moved to Shelbyville, joined this eight-person company that became who are the leaders in the field. So flash forward like 15 years in, I was known in my field. I spoke at conferences. It was at this point in her career that she had met her now ex-husband. So you guys dated for how long? We met in December of 2008. I was 35 and he was 45. I really wanted to get married and have a family. That second part obviously didn't happen. So we met in the airport and it was kind of mutual on both sides. And so by about Valentine's Day, we were saying like, yeah, we're going to get married that we said, we don't have to rush it. Let's not scare the horses. To go that fast, you must have had a badass meeting at the airport. Was it like a movie? Yeah, well, a study, I asked him for directions. But when we started talking, we had so much in common. There was something about us that really clicked and we really got each other. And there were many ways in which we just, we like to spend time the same way. We thought the same way about things, including about money and ways we'll talk about. So we were just very, it felt very familiar. What was each of your financial situations when you started dating and then got married? So I think I probably made $95,000 a year when we met. I had about $100,000 in my 401k. I was just kind of putting one foot in front of the other. I'd gotten raises. I'd gotten bonuses. He had started his career 
and accidentally kind of gone into one high growth company and did that for 10 years and then quit to be a ski bump for two years. He'd been investing pretty regularly. So he had two investment properties. One was a ski condo and one was a six bedroom house that he rented out. And he had a fairly decent stock portfolio. So I don't remember, but if I did ask, you know, my net worth was like a hundred grand. His was maybe two million, something like that when I met him. In my opinion, it's important that you feel the same way about money as your partner early on before deciding to get married. So for example, before I got married, I sat down with my wife and we just made a roadmap where we said, all right, so in 5, 10, 15, 30 years out, what type of life do we want to have? What are our goals, both in terms of what do we want to own? What experiences do we want to have? How would we want to raise our children? What type of values? And then working backwards to say, okay, well, if this is the life that we want, how are we going to afford it? Are you going to work? Am I going to work? Are we both going to work? What are we willing to sacrifice? What are we not willing to sacrifice? How much money do we have to earn to do all this? And what are we going to have to do in order to get there? It sounds kind of cold, but I think a relationship like a husband and wife, I think it's very similar to having a business partner, which means kind of having a loose business plan that you strategically are aligned on with your partner. And you pivot along the way and you learn from mistakes and you maybe evolve and change your opinion. But generally speaking, you're in agreement on how you want your life to be. I think I've got a successful marriage and I have a successful business relationship with my business partners. And we've all done this exact same thing where we said, here's the values that we think we currently stand for. Here's what we want life to look like. And here's what we're both willing to contribute to get that life. And also, more importantly, here's what we're not willing to do. And there's always some type of compromise that comes into play. But at the end of the day, you know what you're willing to do and what you're willing not to do. And you have some type of direction that you are both aligned on. In Jennifer's case, she felt like her and her ex were aligned in the beginning. It seemed like they were eye to eye on money and they had a shared vision of the future. What we mostly focused on was behaviors and habits and thoughts and mindsets around money. So it was kind of like a shared understanding of how money works, how compound interest works, how you build wealth. We kind of had both read The Millionaire Next Door and put that into, obviously I was nowhere close to a millionaire at the time, but we had both kind of absorb this idea of you don't make money just to spend it, you make money to make other money. And that led to us starting a condo business together, having a lot of thoughts and discussions about money. It was all about what we were going to do about money, but it wasn't so we can have X. And in fact, I think that's one thing that wound up to be missing was once you've accumulated all this money, what's it for? What are you doing with it? And the realization I have now is for him, it's just to accumulate it. That's the game and to hold on to it and to make sure nobody takes it away from you. Whereas for me now, but I'm older and put frankly, have more assets and stuff. It's like, well, what's it for? What did you want? I wanted somebody who loved me and I wanted kids and I didn't want much more than that. What did he want? I think he wanted what we talked about I do think he struggled to be able to have it. Once I was there, he struggled with having somebody in his space. Once we had assets and more assets and more assets, he struggled to share them, to even spend more on himself. So I think there's what you think you want in your head and then there's how you live it out. For me, when I got married, it was very easy to make that switch from this is your stuff, this is my stuff, to everything that we own, it's now ours. In fact, I love bragging about this, but my wife was actually a millionaire before I was. And as I was running my business, I didn't pay myself a lot of money and she earned way more than me and helped support me. It didn't take long for me to catch up because I owned a company that I eventually sold for tens of millions of dollars. But when we were young, I was making something like two or $3,000 a month and she was making something like one hundred fifty dollars to $250,000 a year. And that was a huge gap. So yeah, of course I didn't want it to be like, this is yours and this is mine because she had more than me. But after we got married, regardless of who had more or whatever, I didn't have a problem sharing it. Because in my mind, we were a unit and this money was ours. It wasn't mine. It wasn't hers. It was ours. We shared it all. In fact, I thought it was weird. There was this one time that my wife asked me kind of for permission to buy something. And I was like, of course you can buy that. It's your money. Why are you even asking me? Go make your own decision. That being said, if each of us wants to purchase something, I would say the threshold is like two or three thousand dollars. It's sort of expected that we have a conversation that's like, hey, I'm going to go buy this thing, just letting you know. Of course, that threshold, it's different for everyone. 
So after this quick ad break, I want to hear how Jennifer navigated her threshold and how they decided whose money was what. Did they actually share? Did they not share? What did they do? So we'll be right back after this ad break. In Jennifer's case, her ex and her didn't feel the same way about how to share money in their marriage. We were driving one day and I said, hey, we should probably have a conversation about like how we want to start combining our assets because we had had a lot of conversations about how are we going to handle the budget. Now, just a reminder, at this point in the relationship, Jennifer is worth around $100,000 and he's worth something like $2 million. And so I just said, you know, let's have a conversation about how we combine assets. And he basically said, I'm not comfortable with that. Like, I can't get there yet. And also, the household budget that we made was 50-50. I was moving into a house he already owned. So we sat down and like went through well the budgets work. But at the time that he said that, I didn't hear in the sense that I... I kind of thought, I'm not after his money. I can make plenty of my own money. And I thought, out of everything that's good in this relationship, this isn't a hill I need to die on it. It really wasn't a stopping point for me. Now I realize that there was something in there about shared purpose, commitment, generosity of spirit, like someone being all in with both feet that I didn't know how to read. I kind of interpreted it in the most generous way possible and said, that's fine. We can run our lives that way. I'm comfortable with that. I really thought that, you know, a couple years would go by and he'd be more comfortable with it. So I just thought, eh, he'll come around to it. He'll be used to being married, but that didn't happen. <laughs> Ultimately, a lot of this comes down to care. Would you care for the other person if shit hit the fan, emotionally and financially? That was when a lot of red flags started to go off for Jennifer. I always really thought it was our money if it ever really came down to it. You know what I'm saying? Like if I ever lost my job or if I ever, whatever, there was some drama over me moving with my job. And I remember he said at the time, of course we were dating, but he said, move here, I'll support us, we'll figure it out. So he said things, especially in the beginning, that sounded like gets an us thing. It was only when it came time to do it that he kind of balked and kicked the came down the road. So Jennifer and her ex-husband, they kept everything 50-50 for the rest of the relationship. In my opinion, that's insane. In fact, I've got a few friends who do that and I tease them all the time. They'll split things and Venmo each other. So like $25 for an Uber, their portion for dinner, whatever. If you're living on a tight budget, I 100% get why you budget. And I think that's a great idea. But I don't quite understand why people go 50-50. In my opinion, it should all just be one. That's just my opinion though. And I don't really think there's a perfect way to do it. I think what is important though, is that if you decide to split stuff with your partner, it comes back to that shared vision of how you want to live your life. If splitting everything down the middle works for you, go for it. Not for me, but if it makes you happy, I think you should do it. But there's another big factor that comes into play here, and that's transparency around money. When I got married, right away we did one checking, one savings, each have your own credit card, so you can buy some stuff without the other person seeing, like if it's a gift or something. But then it was like all shared passwords. So it, like we had a folder where it was like, hey, I need to log into your account because I'm doing some accounting thing. I need to like be able to see whatever. And there really was no secrets. Right. What did you do? Yeah, I felt like there were no secrets because I had to log into his computer. I, had, I knew the password to his uh, computer and phone. I never looked at it. But we had one shared account, and the only thing that went into that account was the proceeds from the ski condo that we owned together. But everything else was separate, checking, saving, credit cards. I never saw his brokerage statements, and so I remember... Did you know what was in there? Yeah, because we would talk about it, and he would check his E-Trade in front of me. Um, so I kind of had a clock on this is about what's in there. He would talk about, oh, I paid off this condo. So he would tell me that he was doing all that stuff, but I never really... I never saw it. But around this time, the relationship dynamic started to change as Jennifer began building her wealth. A reminder that her ex and her, they owned a couple condos at the time that they were renting out to each other. So they had a shared business together. At what point into the marriage did you start your business? We've been together about six and a half years when I started the business. And at the time, he throughout the whole period, he was working at tech companies and investing his money into real estate. And so he was like, you guys were like almost part-time landlords, full-time workers, right? Yeah. So we've been building that real estate business together, which honestly was a great practice for me in terms of just starting to think like a business person. So it's 2015, you start your company 
did you have income coming in from the business immediately or did you, did, was it like a lot of people where it's like it took a year or two for you to actually make a livable wage? I had income coming in from the business with a caveat, with a little bit of uh, delay. The business was profitable to start with. I had money coming in right away. So, um, well, it started out as a consultant to my previous employer and then a consultant to another person while I built up a book of business. At what point in the business did you start earning more than him? Yeah, the very first year that I had it overlapped with what became his last year at his employer. So we were able to go out on his insurance, which was great. But he left his business in August or 2016. And from then on, I made more than him. And, you know, I'll say that I would try and talk to him about things like, hey, now that you're staying home, why don't we live on my income? And voila, like I was trying to say, let's be a team in ways that would have benefited him. Um, but he, he wasn't really interested in that. So fast forward to 2022 or so, 2023, you end up getting divorced. What was your, what do you think your, each of your net worth was at that point? Yeah, well, I know exactly because we did our financial things with lawyers. So he had about $8 million in Apple stock and other investments with about a $1 million loan against it because in the low interest days, he didn't sell stock to make money. He just borrowed against it. And then about $3 million in real estate. So he had eight minus one, plus three. And my business conveniently took money last year and it got valued at 19.5 million. And my share of that is eight and change. And then we borrowed a million. <laughs> so kind of a similar eight with a $1 million loan. Well, that's not against me personally. And then I had about a million in both retirement and post-tax investments. Wow. So you, as a group, you're worth $20 million. Yeah, exactly. Considering that Jennifer and her ex had made a lot of money at this point, they really weren't living that crazy of lifestyle or anything like that. They were spending as if they were middle managers making $150,000 a year. We lived in the same townhouse he bought in 2003, and he wouldn't let me buy new furniture for because he was really attached to what was there. Now, we, we did have, now, you would go helicopter skiing in Canada. We are a $200,000 wine cellar. We would go out and have dinner and spend $700 like whatever, we would take vacations, but we did live the way that you would imagine people with a $20 million net worth did. What do you think your uh, monthly expenses were? They were so low because like a mortgage was $1,300. And then I say maybe, maybe $3,500, $4,000 of fixed costs. Maybe it was probably a lot less than that because our cars were paid off and everything. So yeah, I started making a much higher income and I started enjoying spending it, but we didn't go crazy. So what, 10 grand a month maybe? Yeah, not even, honestly, honestly. I was so heads down focused on building the business and I built a really particular kind of day-to-day -day lifestyle around that where like, it was important to me to kind of be calm and have a lot of space in my life and that kind of thing. So I think I was just so focused on building the business. What was your um, income? I paid myself relative to the profits of my business. It was anywhere from, we'll call it over 200,000, but it would go up one year, it was half a million. At this point, everything seems to be going pretty well for Jennifer and her ex. They built up a sizable amount of wealth and are living well, and they go on vacations and do all those nice things. And around this time, Jennifer was bringing in personally around half a million dollars from her business. But it was about to all come crashing down. And this part of the story is wild. Listen to this. He gave me an STD and then lied about it for seven months while I went to different doctors to try and figure out what it was. It's a curable and treatable and cured and treated but it took a long time to chase it down because I had a 15 year history of being monogamous. It was really light symptoms. So yeah, he lied about it for seven months, even though I asked him directly and finally at a doctor who figured out what it was and he was away on a camping trip. And I had about four or five days to get my head around it, talk to friends, like figure out what I was gonna do and wrote him a letter and said, I'm moving out, I'm filing for divorce. That's it, you know? Fucking insane. Yeah. I'm so sorry. That is awful. That sucks. Yeah, I was shot. And I was like, he's been lying to my face for seven months. And it was very clarifying where I was like, this guy's not on my side. This guy's not my partner. I owe him nothing. I'm going to take care of myself. And that was what I did. Holy shit. What was he doing? 
just sleeping around? You know what? I, I had no idea. I do know now from him that he was cheating with an ex-girlfriend who's been married for 20 years back in 2020. But if I had to guess, I bet not right away in the marriage that he had an extracurricular sex life that was probably a mix of old girlfriends, people in his network, people he picked up like coffee shops. So the next step for Jennifer was to get out of there. She moved out of the place that they were sharing and she went and set up her own place. So I rented a one bedroom downtown that I went to every day and I had a desk in the bedroom and I had it all outfitted. I had pots and pans and, you know, bathroom, kitchen. Now, at this point, I know you're all wondering if they had a prenup. We're going to hear all about it right after this ad break. A lot of high net worth people, they get prenups before they get married to protect themselves from losing over half their fortune. In Jennifer's case, they didn't have one. He was so weird about money kind of midway through the marriage. I realize in retrospect, there was probably a point at which he decided he don't want to be married anymore. And they probably looked into the divorce and was shocked to see I was going to get half the money. But around 2018, 2019, you started being really weird about what like, he would just um, hold money over my head. And what do you say? Well, I'll give an example. He, um, this is from a slightly different time frame, but he had this weird um, AFib episode, like a heart thing, when he was skiing one day. And afterwards, I said to him, you know, you should probably write a will. You have sisters, you have, you know, nieces and nephews. Like, and he said to me, I feel like you're just trying to get my money. And so that was kind of how he would be. So the next step in Jennifer's ordeal was to get a lawyer to help figure out how to divide up their assets. I hired kind of the top attorney in Springfield because I had a business to think about. I just want to like, I want this handled. I want to be protected. I want someone who can win in court appeal. Like I want a good attorney for my lawyer. I was a wonderful prospect for fee pay, right? So we had seven properties. I had a business. He had investments. I had investments. And so my lawyer laid out this whole thing where like, I retain an accountant and he values my business. And then those guys retain an accountant and they value their business. And like we'd get all the property valued. Like basically you get everything valued and then you literally just split everything in half and give it to people. The rules around getting divorced, they vary by state to state. But generally it tends to be 50-50. Each person gets half of the shared assets. For Jennifer, it was pretty complicated because she had this growing business and it was considered a shared asset. There could have been endless fighting over what's your business worth. I was very fortunate because I had a valuation from that July. Especially for me, one of the biggest things was the impact on my business of carrying out a long divorce. I had to go to my business partners and say, I'm getting divorced and it's quite possible there's going to be a discovery, right, of all our records because his lawyers are going to want to know what representations have we made about not just what the company is worth now, but what's it worth in five years? What's the future value of it? So basically, his lawyer and my lawyer have to figure out what this thing's worth so they can split it up. And they might try and negotiate the price down because they frankly found some information about something I said that I don't know I wouldn't want to get out. And did it end with you getting any of his or each of you just walking exactly half? Like you own your business and your 401k and your own accounts and he gets his own accounts. It was basically, I get my business, I get my 401k, and I get the money I've put into real estate plus the appreciation. He was so stingy about that that I probably got forty to 60000 less than the minimum I should have gotten. And how do you get that money? Because they, he's had to sell the properties or because he just gave it out of his liquid? He just gave it out of his liquid. That was the reason I took the settlement. I took, I took a settlement because it would be over. If I just decided to treat it as a bad investment, get my money back and walk away. And I got it in cash. If I gotten it any other way, I would have wound up with properties and stocks and cars and things like that. Her lawyer encouraged her to not take a settlement. Of course, it's in the best interest to say that and to get you to fight as long as possible and to get as much liquid assets as possible. They get to take a sizable chunk of that. However, her lawyer shared that the settlement could be a risk for her business. She said to me, this is terrible idea. You're taking a risk. She said, I understand. You're a bright young woman. Your business is doing well now. It might fall apart tomorrow. And I've had clients who had divorce settlements based on businesses that fell apart. And she said, he has his money. As he said, he's liquid. He has his money. He can sit on a beach. She really thought I was doing the wrong thing. 
Jennifer decided that continuing to fight this in court, it was not worth her time. Something has also got to be said for just what that means for her peace of mind from just moving on from a bad situation, even if you might be getting less than what seems fair. I was like, I can fight this for two years. It had probably cost me a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars. And at the end of two years, my business might be worth so much more that not only do I not get any of his money, I have to give him a bunch of my equity. And I thought to myself, I was actually on a lawn drive across the country for where I was spending the holidays, and I knew the amount of the settlement that was proposed, and I was just sitting with it. And I thought to myself, am I really okay with that? And my brain said, there's more money where that came from. Cut your losses and bet on yourself and just move on and build your business. With all legal cases, there's your logical brain and then there's the emotional brain. And you kind of got to listen to both. If you get hit with a lawsuit where you know you didn't do anything wrong, your instinct might be to fight and win at all costs. But you have to ask yourself, is this really worth the money and the time and the emotional investment? Often, and I've experienced this before, you just got to give in and lose that case in order to actually win and get past it. This has definitely happened to me where I feel like I've had people that totally wronged me and they wanted something out of me and I could fight it, but I was probably just going to lose more money and time than just paying them off and ending the situation. And that sucks, but it's a lot of times the right thing to do. But depending how you look at it, you might be winning overall. With marriage, to lose might even be harder. That person, they probably made you suffer. And frankly, you want to make them suffer too. All that being said, the fact that Jennifer and her ex split everything 50-50 actually made the divorce much simpler. It was very, very obvious to point to whose was whose. In We didn't have to pay lawyers or accountants to do a calculation. How is your money outlook and your money behaviors and your money thinking changed since the roughly, it's been roughly one year. It sounds and like you've wanted to spend more. Are you spending more? I thought I'm comfortable with money and I'm going to spend money and make a really beautiful life for myself. So I have a gorgeous apartment in Shelbyville. I bought furniture that I love. You I'm, let loose a little. I, yeah, and I love it. Has that made you happier? Oh, I will say it a second or third day I was in this apartment, even before I had any furniture. I remember it's this beautiful like Florida ceiling windows looks out on the Shelbyville Harbor. And I walked into my living room and there were like, it was still the holidays. So like there were like Christmas lights outside. I'm up on the 13th floor. And I just thought I am so happy that I thought if I hadn't gotten divorced, I never would have gotten this. But this is awesome. So I love it. What's your expenses now? Uh, much higher. I mean, my my rent is six thousand dollars a month, sixty four hundred with parking. Ironically, I'm spending probably a lot less on restaurants and travel and stuff. But all in, I'm probably spending about eight or nine thousand dollars a month. If you had to be open to younger you or younger people like you, what are some bits of wisdom that you wish you would have known back then, or things you would warn yourself about? Well, if we're talking about relationships and relationships and money. The way someone acts around money in a relationship is a sign that you should pay attention to. And I think now that I'm older, I always dated for what I'll call interest and passion. Like I always wanted really interesting people with big thoughts and like I got someone very interesting. But what I discounted was it matters that they be kind. It matters that they care for you. It matters like there are people out there in the world who are thrilled to care for somebody, right? And if someone isn't showing you that care, it's not because it's going to warm up and it's going to show up later. Do you think that you can change people? Like, I know that, like, I've dated people before who I'm not married to now, and I was like, this sucks, it will change. I think we change people by being in their lives, but I don't think we get to direct those changes. And also, if you don't like them now... How can you guarantee you'll like them if they do change? Because maybe something else will change, you know? So I don't know. I think you're better off picking for the now than what you think it could be. But moving on from something like what Jennifer experienced could be hard to do. This isn't something that you can just get over easily, especially since deception is involved. Forgiveness, I think, is incredibly challenging and complicated. I have not fully forgiven him for what I went through in the six or so weeks after I discovered it. It's an incredibly violating thing to have someone give you an STD 
And so I don't know if I've fully forgiven him for putting me through that. But mostly when I think about him, I think the consequences are his own life. I don't think he has lives a happy life. He's a wealthy guy who isn't really enjoying his wealth. And he doesn't have a lot of close relationships. A lot of his friends had moved away or they live out of town. He doesn't seem to have, I think, any real romantic relationships. And I don't know. I, I kind of feel like the consequences for him are the life he lives right now. I said this before, I've had a lot of these conversations, but this one in particular left me inspired. Jennifer's story, I mean, it was riveting, like strictly from a story's perspective with the whole STD thing and her husband kind of being an oddball, like I was enthralled by the story. But, and this is more important, I was inspired that she sort of had a little bit of forgiveness in her voice. And I was also inspired because she seems like a super strong person. She was very positive while I was talking to her, both before and after the interview. And I think that she was wronged. Someone did something really bad to her, but because she's so positive about this experience and she's moving forward and that she was transparent about this whole thing to me, I thought it was badass. I really, really enjoyed talking to Jennifer. And so my big takeaway from this, amongst many things, frankly, is that the best way to get revenge on someone is just to be a better person, is to succeed and is to be happy. So Jennifer, if you're listening, I appreciate you doing this. Of course, I gotta give a plug for Hampton. Hampton's the company that makes this podcast. Hampton's my company. You can check it out at joinhampton.com. Our average CEO, who's a member, they do something like $25 million a year in revenue. Although we have companies doing about one or 2 million in revenue, all the way up to hundreds of millions in revenue, companies that are publicly traded, companies that are new-ish and are just getting going. And if you like this conversation, we have conversations like this all of the time in Hampton. These private conversations that you can only get amongst other high net worth people who are willing to be vulnerable. That stuff is impossible to Google. I'm trying to make it a little bit easier with this podcast, but we get a ton of it every day at Hampton. So check it out, joinhampton.com. And of course, I've got to give a shout out to Lower Street, lowerstreet.co. That's the company that produced this podcast. If you are a business looking to make a podcast like this, they make it easy. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done this because it honestly is really hard, but Lower Street made it happen. So I appreciate them. So if you want a podcast like this, again, lowerstreet.co. I'll talk to you guys next week with another episode of Money Wise. Talk to you soon. Money.